Good morning, everybody. I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer uh, of Emory Executive Education at the Goizueta Business School. And thank you for joining us today. One of the things that we're constantly investing energy in is understanding the mindsets, the skill sets, and the tools that professionals, managers, and executives in business must acquire to become the leaders of tomorrow, the people who help shape their organizations, their industries, and their communities. Some of these capabilities are the result of new to the world technologies like AI that require leaders to reconceive, reimagine their products and services, their go to market strategies, and even their business models in order to survive, to thrive, and outcompete. Others are the result of changes in expectations and the power of different stakeholder groups. Just think about how your teams work today versus how they worked in say, you know, February 2020 before the before the COVID pandemic. These are all drivers that require us to pay attention to how we lead, what we spend our time on. And at some points in our career, we need to pivot in order to be successful from working in the business to working on the business. And that's the topic of the conversation uh, today with Brandon Smith who was one of our affiliate faculty and an alum of the Goizmata Business School. He is a leading expert on leadership communication, workplace dysfunction, and is known as the workplace therapist. He is a sought after executive coach, TEDx speaker, and one of our most popular executive education facilitators. And now I believe he adds weightlifting to his, uh, to his resume. <laughs> Brandon's going to uh, spend probably about 30, 35, 40 minutes talking about uh, this, this issue of how do we work on the business as leaders, not in the business. And we invite you to post your questions in the chat and also the Q&A, and we'll get to as many of them through, the, through our conversation today and also at the end. If you'd like to explore the leadership concepts from today's session in more detail and more depth with Brandon, I do invite you to join us for uh, in October for our Executive Communications and Leadership Presence course. And if you're interested in other opportunities to hone your capabilities as a leader who can shape their organization, there are a few upcoming courses that I encourage you to look at. One is the AI and machine learning for business executives. So how do you understand this technology and the people that know how to use this technology as you think about your strategies, you think about your operations and your organization, also disrupting your business strategy uh, and leading an inspiring change. Those two courses are coming up in November. And again, will help equip you with the knowledge and the skills to thrive in this very competitive environment that most organizations are finding themselves in today. Enjoy the morning with Brandon, and I look forward to continuing the conversation on the first Thursday in October, when Jesse Boxstead will join us to discuss AI and the interactions between AI and humans in business processes and decision making. So that's another one not to uh, not to um, uh, miss. So Brandon, over to you. Nicola, thank you. Uh, well, team, really excited to be with you all here this morning. Excited about our conversation. Uh, if you are here joining us this morning, uh, you probably are loyal followers of our, our series on Business Over Breakfast, uh, but you also may have a particular interest in some tools and strategies to help you spend a little less time in the weeds, a little less time firefighting, doing the work of your teams, and a little more time on the business. And that really is the central focus of our conversation here today. So as, as Nicholas said, I'm an affiliate faculty member here at the business school. I, I have taught both in exec ed for many, many years, but also in all the degree programs. Uh, my area of expertise is around leadership communication and how to do that more effectively. Uh, it's a pretty big beach to play on. So that includes everything from leading change to how we lead our teams uh, more effectively, uh, even collaborate, align, and even manage politics. Uh, and so all those topics well, will be topics we'll cover in our open enrollment course uh, on executive communication and leadership presence in October. If you're interested, we also try and do that, that course twice a year as well, if October is a little too close around the corner for you. So let's let's jump into our uh, topic here today. So I've got a few objectives for us here today. 
Um, as Nicola said, she's going to be kind of watching over the chat function for us. If something comes up and you and you've got a question, uh, please jump in. I want to make this as interactive as possible. So while we'll have questions at the end, you are welcome to ask questions during the session. I will attend to them as they come. Uh, a few objectives for us here in my session, we're going to define what are ways that we can keep ourselves on the business rather than in the business. Some ways to help us spend a little more time there. We're going to discuss practical ways to more effectively shift seats to be a more effective leader. Uh, I'm, I'm going to share with you uh, the concept of author versus editor. It's the topic of the book I published last year uh, on, on this idea of helping us move from in the business to on the business. And with any session like this, the best way you can approach this is take notes, be thoughtful about what resonates with you, and identify that one thing you could either be doing more of or differently at the end. Uh, we live in a world where time is our most precious resource. Uh, it's not money, it's time. And everything is urgent all the time. So in that whirlwind, less is more. So you're, you are making an investment of your time here this morning for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, I want you to get a return on that investment. And so uh, be thoughtful about what is your takeaway, something you can start doing tomorrow that will help move you closer to working on the business. So I I'm going to take us now on our journey. I'm going to start off. Any journey should be started off, I think, with a story. So we're going to start off with a story. So we're going to go uh, um, and, and examine a business, go back in time a little bit here, and we're going to examine Chick-fil-A. So many of you on the call are probably familiar with Chick-fil-A. If you're not familiar with Chick-fil-A, uh, it is tr traditionally has been the number one quick service restaurant chain um, in the United States. Uh, number one in every metric that matters. Number one in revenue per store, profitability per store, quality scores, customer retention, and employee retention. So those five metrics, they're number one in all, all those five. So really well-run business. And so uh, some years ago, I was asked to help them uh, develop a way to think about how they can more efficiently and effectively train and develop their operators. So their operators, if you're not familiar with the business model, their operators are essentially their franchise owners, but they don't own those stores like you would see in a traditional fast food uh, chain. Um, they actually put a deposit down, $15,000, I believe is the current amount, and then they split the P&L um, with corporate um, every month. And so that's that's how it works, a little different. And they can have up to two stores. So uh, once they select an operator, and, and the selection process is extremely rigorous, they select less than less than half a percent of all operators that apply. Uh, then it was a question, how do they develop these operators? So we went through and we did this very large study that involves surveys and interviews, and we were able to take those operators, all the operators across the chain, and rank them on those five metrics, okay, revenue per store, profitability per store, quality scores, customer retention, and employee retention. And based on those five metrics, we could get an overall ranking. So we knew who was number one in the chain all the way down. Okay, so I'm setting all this up because once we started to look at the behaviors this is what we ended up with. So what you're looking at here is uh, essentially a developmental model. And you can see if we go to our kind of uh, the, our vertical axis from up, up and down on our far left, uh, it goes from kind of uh, uh, it's dollars. OK, and then our, our horizontal axis, which goes from left to right, it goes from working in the business to on the business. Now, Chick-fil-A is a privately held company. So we don't have specific numbers. So you can treat dollars as either profit or revenue tracks about the same. And you can see that um, as our leader develops, she or he goes from working in the business to on the business, we can also see an impact in dollars. So let's talk about some of these stages of development. So when we took all the operators and we looked at them across all this, what we found was the lowest performing operators had certain behaviors which were keeping them stuck in that lower performance way. And they were really deeply rooted in the business. And so you can see they were, we call that group the manager group because they were really operating like managers. So when I was trying to discern a little bit more about the behaviors that they were exhibiting, I had phone calls set up with some of those operators that were in the bottom of, of the rankings. And what was interesting about it is the phone calls did not go as I'd expected at all. So I thought I was going to hear these individuals tell me how hard it is to run a restaurant, which I would totally agree hard. And Chick-fil-A is not open seven days a week, but they're open six days a week. So it's, it's a lot. Uh, that's not what happened at all. In fact, all those operators in the bottom of the chain, they missed every single one of my phone calls. And it wasn't because they didn't care. It was because 
they missed the phone call because they were counting coins in the register. They were out doing landscaping in front of the store rather than hiring a contractor. One operator was cleaning the toilet in the bathroom. They didn't delegate anything. So you can see the first step at a fundamental level is delegation. Now, now this is like delegation, what we're going to be talking about here today, but it's it's like delegation squared. It's really delegation for leaders and executives. So you're going to see why in a little bit. But the delegator was our second stage. Once they started delegating, immediate bump up in terms of uh, performance, um, and they start sharing responsibilities and delegating. That moves us into the builder stage. This was when those operators got a little more comfortable, really getting rooted into the business. And they not only were, not only were they delegating, they were trying to identify processes, procedures, other things they could make more efficient and more consistent. And then that moved us into the fourth stage, which we call the explorer stage. That's when they got their team operating so well and so high performing, their direct reports, so all their managers and general manager, uh, and they got the culture operating so well that they could start to venture outside the store knowing things were going to be fine. Uh, I've heard lots of ways of defining culture over the years. One of my favorites is culture is what happens when you're not around. Culture is what happens when you're not around. And so these operators really got the culture honing and humming so well that they could they could leave the store and feel comfortable. And they got to explore, go out and look for other opportunities. And then we get into our last stage here, which is the innovator. And the innovator, these were the top 10 folks in the chain. These were the ones just absolutely driving all of the micro innovations across the chain. From you know a hand ground pepper at the, at the table to daddy daughter date nights to whatever other kind of events that they had going on, these folks came up with it. And when I made these phone calls, they they made every one of the phone calls. There wasn't one missed phone call. And these are the top performing operators. And they were typically sitting in a coffee shop on a Monday morning, doing strategic planning for the week while their store was of course operating. And then their plan was to go to the local high school, and they were going to personally interview for talent at the local high school. Uh, and then hit the mayor's office later that day and lobby for a new light to be put in in, in, in front of their store. Because as you know, with Chick-fil-A, even through the pandemic, it's been quite popular and crowded. One of the biggest challenges at Chick-fil-A today is in addition to sourcing chicken, it's managing the traffic flow in their parking lots. Um, so they were lobbying for a new light. And then finally, they were going to close out some catering orders at the end of the day, fully working on the business and outside of those four walls to really help help grow it, whether it's close out more sales, put in for more infrastructure to help make it run more efficiently or select those right team members. So I think it's a great story to get us thinking a little bit about um, what does it look like for us if we can get to the place of being on the business and how that might even translate to performance. And we can see it uh, really clearly here in the Chick-fil-A story. So one more important uh, element around the Chick-fil-A story all Chick-fil-A operators, if you are selected as a Chick-fil-A operator, uh, the first day, your role and, and, and world would look a lot like this. Every single person in your ecosystem would be reporting to you. You'd want to get a handle on all your team members. So general managers, to unit marketing directors, to team members, to managers, all reporting to you. And some uh, Chick-fil-A operators stayed that way, stayed like hub and spoke with everybody reporting to them. This may look like your world today. Uh, and while we all start there, we want to move ourselves out of that. And so what the great Chick-fil-A operators did was they essentially were able to pull themselves out and they played two critical roles. So first, for their direct reports, they played more of a coaching role. So they were coming in to help coach them, get them better, support them. So you can see that's their general managers and managers, they're coaching them. And for everybody else, they're more like the protector of the culture. Every time they come in, they're talking about the values and really modeling how they want everyone to show up. So rather than being the centerpiece for everybody's world, they shifted into coach for their senior team and then uh, protector of the culture for everybody else. Okay, so let's take this story and now let's make it practical for you. Uh, so I'm going to start off by uh, this central question, which was one of the questions we were asking with the Chick-fil-A operators. H how are they using their time and how should they be using their time? A and so many of you are familiar probably with this classic matrix, this classic two by two. Um, you know, I teach at a business school, so I'm required in every presentation I give to either share at least either a Venn diagram or a two by two. So <laughs> here's your two by two for today. Uh, 
So this is the made popular by Stephen Covey, Covey also called the Eisenhower matrix. Uh, and it's essentially, we've got these two critical axes. Uh, we've got importance, which is our vertical axis. It goes from low to high. And then we have urgency, which is our horizontal axis. And it goes from high to low. And it's all about kind of managing this. So in a perfect world, everything that came across our plate, everything that came to us, we would decide what box does it go in. And then we would act accordingly. So to orient you to this particular matrix, it's a little different than what we're used to. Rather than focus our eyes on top right, we tend to focus our eyes on um, top left on this one, the orange box. High urgency, high importance. These are things that are crises and pressing issues. Okay? Then if we use this in order, we would then go to the yellow box. So that's low urgency, but high importance. So before we get too comfortable with this being in second place, I want to honor what's in that box. It's strategy and it's culture. Okay. No one's ever going to say strategy is urgent, culture is urgent, but they're always going to say it's important. We would say it's important. Okay. And so we would need to make sure we spend our time there. I had a guest on my podcast. Uh, I've had I, I have several podcasts, uh, the Workplace Therapist Show, which I've had for many, many years, and then the Leadership Boundary Podcast, where I interview leaders. And I had one on a few years ago. Her name was Penny Zanger, and she goes by the handle, the Focusologist. And she said, um, actually, you should start with the yellow box first, because that's the stuff that is so critical, because the orange box will swallow it up. And we know that all too well. So let's come back to that in a minute. And then we'll see at the very bottom our green box and our blue box. Um, uh, I, I'm not even going to spend any time, any time on those folks, because I, I actually don't care. I don't want you doing anything in the green or blue. They are low importance. So um, whether we call them high urgency or low urgency, they are low importance. So these things should be um, delegated um, or deleted, perhaps, or maybe even delayed. I had a, uh, another guest on my podcast a few years ago, uh, Robert Sawyer, and he said, you know, when things come his way, he uses the four Ds. Do, delegate, delete, or delay. And so the bottom ones, we don't want to do those. Now, I share all this story with you. And this model with you, because the world we live in today, we have a tendency to treat everything like it's orange. So I just logically went through how we should approach stuff, but we don't do that. We treat everything like it's orange and we make everything urgent and important. And when we do that, what happens is we get sucked into in the business. We get sucked into firefighter role. And we're in, when we're in firefighter role day in and day out, that we are not able to work on the business. So we need to make sure that, um, A, we're not finding ourselves being thrown into that and, and getting sucked into that. And B, we're elevating and equipping our team to deal with more of the day-to-day -day fires so we have a little more time to stick our head above the above the tree line. Uh, so just to kind of summarize this point a little bit more, our greatest danger is letting the urgent things crowd out the important. Um, or in the book I published in 2020, The Hot Sauce Principle, How to Live and Lead in the World Where Everything's Urgent All the Time. Plenty of things in our world are covered in hot sauce. And so making sure that we're able to manage this stuff is also important. So let's move down into kind of the, the, the central premise of our conversation here today. Uh, how can we do this a little bit better? So we're going to move into this primary topic of author versus editor. This is a topic that uh, I uh, kind of stumbled into this concept when I was coaching clients so in addition to being an affiliate um, faculty member at the business school, a good 50, 60, 75% of my time is spent as an individual executive coach. So I'm a practitioner. I work with individual leaders. And about six years ago, I started working with leaders and, and bringing up this concept of author versus editor. One day, this kind of stumbled into our conversation. I used it probably because I was working on a book at the time, and it just seemed like an analogy that made sense to me. And every single conversation that I've had with my clients since then in six years has revolved around this topic. It comes up over and over again. So let me share the concept with you. It's really simple, um, but it's also quite applicable likely to your world. So um, the way the, world, the concept works is whenever there's a direct report and a leader in that dynamic, someone always has to sit in the author seat and someone always has to sit in the editor seat. And knowing what seat to sit in is key. And so to cut to the chase, as leaders, when we're with our teams, I want you sitting in that editor seat 80% of the time. 
eight, zero, 80 percent of the time and authoring only 20. Uh, and that makes perfect sense when you think about your all time best direct reports. Your all time best direct reports come to you and they say, hey, Nicola, there's an issue or problem. Here's what I think we should do about it. I'd love to get your thoughts. They author a solution for you to edit. Uh, which is great. We love that. It makes our world so much easier. Our time so much easier. I love that, Brandon, when they do that. And you love that. I mean, we all love that. It's great. It just, it makes the conversation richer and it's building and it's fantastic. Now, when we have our not maybe so effective direct reports, uh, they'll often say things like, well, there's a problem or issue. What do you want me to do about it? And as soon as they raise their hands in the air like that, while that may seem innocent, and it probably is, what they're really doing there, consciously or subconsciously, is they're reeling you into that author seat. And now you're either telling them what to do, which takes a lot more time, or because everything is urgent all the time, covered in hot sauce, we say, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'll just do it for you. And then when we author for them, not only does it take more time, remember, both seats have to be filled. So they get to sit in the editor seat. They can say, well, it's not it's not my fault. I'm just doing what Brandon told me to do. Don't, don't look at me. Or... Don't look at me. He took it from me and did it. So sitting in the right seats is key. So let's go a little bit further down the path of the seats. Here, here is the role of the editor. So when we are properly sitting in the editor seat with our team, it is a coaching seat. So let me hit the first point here. We still set clear expectations. So we don't just say, well, good luck, figure it out. No, we, we don't quite give them that much ambiguity. We still say, Here's the why of what I'm asking for. Here's the what of what I'm asking for. And here's the win of what I'm asking for. But I'm going to let you come up and craft the how. So we're, we're still establishing our commander's intent. Uh, if you know our, our, our colleague in the business school, uh, retired Lieutenant General Ken Keene talks about commander's intent. So we still establish our commander's intent, the why, the what, the win. But we allow our team members to bring us the how. They bring it to us and then we coach the author on the how, what they're bringing us to develop his, her or his thinking, her or his approach to problem solving, and her or his work product. We don't solve the problem for them. And when we consistently do this in our one-on-ones, so each one-on-one, -on -one, they're always bringing you something. Each one-on-one, -on -one, we're helping refine their thinking. It's the path to developing a high-performing team that can function without you, allowing you to work more on the business rather than in the business. So here's your, your first practical takeaway. Change how you're doing your one-on-ones. Don't, if, as soon as your direct reports come in empty-handed, by definition, you're authoring. Okay, and we don't want to do that. So always require they bring you something to edit, something to react to. Uh, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, that's, our, that's our first step. When we talk about the role of the author, now uh, here, is, here are the characteristics of the author. We know we've got a natural author on our hands when we see these three traits. They take ownership. They show initiative and they display critical thinking. Take ownership, show initiative, display critical thinking. Many of us live in organizations, work in organizations where we've got all these different ways of thinking about high potentials and there's two by twos and three by threes and four by four matrices and all that. That's all fine. This is the simplest way to think of a high potential. High potentials do these three things. Ownership, initiative, critical thinking. They present recommendations and a point of view to uh, our manager for feedback. Um, and it's the path to greater, they don't say, what do you want me to do? And this is the path to greater leadership opportunities and being recognized as an emerging leader in any organization. So let me pause here. There's a couple important points I want to make on this slide. So first, uh, you're on this call likely because you chose to be here, right? You took ownership and initiative, probably critical thinking too. So I'm going to place a big assumption here, but I think an important one. We've got natural authors on the call here today, which is fantastic. I love natural authors. I frankly think the world needs more natural authors. However, natural authors do have one Achilles heel. We tend not to know when not to author. So everything that comes our way, we say, oh, I can help with that. Oh, I can do that for you. Oh, sure, I'll help out here. We really, in a perfect world, we should be authoring up and editing down. Authoring up, editing down. So every meeting with your leader you go to, you should always have a clear point of view and maybe even recommendations every single meeting, not just status updates, but what's your point of view around that status update? What's your analysis or interpretation of that update? And then recommendations. We author up and we edit down. Uh, 
And when the world works that way, when, when everyone in the system offers up and then it's down, leaders typically work about 50 hours a week, maybe 55 at the very, very most. However, if that flow reverses and we author down, so either we're getting micromanaged or we're or our team just won't take ownership and we have to tell them what to do and do stuff for them, that's when leaders' hours creep well over 65 or 70 hours. So as you're sitting here today on this call, you find you've got a little bit of a time challenge and you're working too many hours, yeah. it could be an author editor opportunity. Brandon, have a yeah. question here. How do you help and how do you perhaps catalyze your people to take ownership and show initiative and display critical thinking? I mean, what are there some tips and tricks to sort of help them build those capabilities that when it doesn't come so naturally to them? Absolutely. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the traps and some of the challenges in just a minute. But at a high level, the first step is you must require that they bring something to your one-on-ones. I know I've said that before, but that's the first step because what you're doing is you're requiring ownership, initiative, and critical thinking. And then based on how they deliver on those things, you know where to edit and support them. So, and you'll find that maybe for some folks, uh, they just have a hard time with the ownership or initiative. They're, they lack that confidence. For others, they've got the ownership and initiative, but they're not really thinking through the problems really well. Well, then you can help coach them on the critical thinking. But the first step is in order to know how to help them, we need some kind of a baseline to evaluate. So you need them to bring you something. Uh, if they don't bring you anything, you, you'll never know. So that's the first step is encouraging that. I'm going to share a few more subtleties in how we help elevate individuals at different kind of uh, deficiencies in just a minute. So so stay stay tuned. Thanks so much. Of course. So I did say 80% of the time we want to edit. And I said 20% of the time we want to make sure we're in that author seat as leaders. These are the only two things that our team cannot do and that we really need to be doing if we want to create a world championship team. And first... Uh, strategy slash priorities. Our team needs us to talk about this and clarify this for them. So strategy with a big S is like our strategy for the quarter uh, or strategy for the year, the goals and metrics that we really need to hit. Um, strategy with a little S would be priorities, priorities for the week. So what are the things that the team really needs to focus on in a given week? They, they need us to tell them that um, because they, their world's just as noisy as ours is. Everything's covered in hot sauce for them too. So they need to know what are those three to five things to focus on. The other thing that we need to be spending time on rather than doing the work of our team is talking about culture and establishing culture and thinking about how do we create that culture that is going to reinforce itself. So when we're off doing other things, we know the team's going to function at a high level because they've got, they've got the right culture and it's going to attract the right kind of team members. So spending time on those as well. There are, uh, two other cases where we might need to author ad hoc. The first one is we've onboarded somebody brand new to the organization. Uh, they don't necessarily know the culture, know what we expect in terms of authoring. And so we may, we may need to co-author a little bit more with them. So similar to the question earlier around how do we help, uh, you know, help elevate people into ownership, initiative, and critical thinking, having a little more conversations and walk with them on what we expect and, and don't expect. And then the other one is, uh, when there's a true emergency situation that requires our expertise. Uh, so not, not just the run-of-the-mill emergencies, which we all get sucked into. I'm talking about those 10% of emergencies, which are so uh, unique that uh, no one else on the team's ever seen it. And they really need us to lean in and provide our particular point of view, uh, perhaps like a pandemic, for example. So these would be ad hoc situations we might need to author. But for the most part, we want to spend our 20% of our time authoring, talking about strategy and priorities, and talking about culture. Just like those Chick-fil-A operators, that was the pivot point for them that kicked them all the way into the high-performing levels. So, uh, so that's the concept in short. Let me share a few ways we screw this up, uh, some of the challenges and obstacles, because uh, as a senior executive shared with me a few months ago, um, from a very well-known business, uh, he said, you know, this makes perfect sense. Agree 100%. Execution is hard. And he's right. So let's talk about some of the challenges around execution. So here's the first one. I've been alluding to this, the hero trap. So as the manager, it is tempting to be the hero and rescue your team when fires emerge. 
when we rescue our team. So when we go to our, they, they pick up the phone and call us. We, we go to our closet, we throw out our hero cape, we swoop in and save the day. When we do that over and over and over again, we're actually stunting their growth and creating a codependent relationship. Uh, so I didn't share this part about my background. In addition to being an alum of Goy Sweat Out, I also am a, a clinical therapist. I, I had a, a clinical therapy degree. Uh, I practiced for some time in the clinical world. And so as a therapist, I'm uh, not a big fan of codependent relationships. Uh, those are big no-nos. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're not rescuing too much because that actually stunts the growth of the team and it creates a codependent relationship. Or another analogy, imagine you were a trainer and you were taking your team to the gym. Since Nicola talked about me doing weightlifting, let's say you were the trainer, you took your team to the gym and you want to show them how to lift heavier weights and the entire hour you just sat there and lifted all the heavy weights. And they sat there and drank coffee and watched you. Well, the only person getting stronger would be you. So we've got to make sure we're not spending too much of our time lifting the weights they should be lifting because that's where we all got strong. We got strong when we were thrown into challenges. No one came to help us. We had to figure our way out. That's how we develop strength. That's how we develop resilience and confidence and confidence. So we don't want to strip that from our teams. So next time you're asked to rescue the team, consider the following. Is there another member of the team that could solve the problem? Or even consider encouraging members of the team to identify solutions on their own and then maybe come back to you and, you know, and bring you a, a solution at a later point. Uh, so this is a, a quote from a Napa auto care owner. I did a, a talk in Las Vegas last year for about 15,000 auto care owners. Uh, so these are independent mechanics. They own auto shops. They license the Napa brand. Uh, and this getting ready for this talk, this was one of the interviews uh, that I did prior to the talk. And this auto care owner shared this with me. He said, you've done all these jobs. They're easy for you and fun for you. You've gotten out of a mess a million times. You want to be and like to be the hero. But if you want to move yourself to truly being a leader, you need to write a system so others can fix the problem. So just a good reminder for us that while we jump in and it feels good, it, it could actually be doing more harm than good in the long run. Here's our second trap, the fear of failure or loss of control trap. So for some managers, letting their direct reports author can feel like a loss of control. Recognizing that growth comes from failure and that there are more than one to solve a problem can help you overcome this trap. Uh, so here's the an analogy for, for this one. So while, while we critically need to make sure we're sharing with our teams the why, the what, the when, and not tell them the how, if we share with them the why, the what, the when, and the how, okay, so we've now just dictated the why, the what, the when, and the how, we have stripped them from ownership, initiative, and critical thinking. They don't own it. They don't have to take initiative. They don't have to think. They're just cooking our recipe. Um, and, and so when we, when we do that, it really limits their growth. And we end up with a team of cooks. Now, if your team and organizations, like most of the teams and organizations I work with, um, everyone's lean, everyone's stressed, everyone feels overworked. We need a lot more chefs than we need cooks. We need people coming up with their own recipes, not just waiting to be given one. And so it's really, really critical that we, we don't overly prescribe. Now, I recognize some roles uh, have a certain way of doing things for compliance or regulatory reasons. But for, in most cases, there's room for multiple different kinds of solutions. So the pro tip here is, Remind yourself that there are many ways to effectively solve a problem beyond just your own. Focus more on getting or more on the results than the process to get there. And this one's really, really hard. So um, this, I'll give you a, a fun example. This was some years ago. I was coaching a client. This client was for, with a Fortune 50 um, uh, company, and uh, he was a senior executive, and I was doing 360 interviews, and it was some of the best 360 interviews I'd ever done. People repeatedly said, if this leader wants to be the next CEO, they absolutely could. So of course I had to press hard on ways that he could improve. And his direct reports were all vice president level, by the way. So I was asking his direct reports and they said, you know, there's one thing that he does do. Every time there is um, an issue or crisis coming up or we're about to run into problems, he swoops in and fixes it. And they said, you know, that while we appreciate that, we're all seasoned leaders and professionals. We learn best through failure. If he can let us work through a lot of those challenges on our own and not rescue us, 
we would be even better as leaders and, and, and his team would be even better. So I shared that feedback with him. He kind of squinched his nose for a minute. He looked at me and he said, uh, I'm not there yet. So letting go and letting our teams kind of work through challenges on their own can be really hard for a lot of us. Here's our last trap. I have a question for you. What, how do you help a team member who is a, maybe a perfectionist is the right word to, to say on these things. So they want to get it right. And so they, they look to you for the how and they keep wanting the how because they want to get it right. So how do you deal with that situation? So actually, Nicola, you set that up really well. It's going to relate to this slide. So let me okay. answer the question first, and then I'll dovetail into the slide. So when we have team members that they are really perfectionists, they, they, there is kind of a fear of failure. They don't want to fail. So it's not so much our fear of failure. It's their fear of failure. Um, and there's a, a feeling that, you know, if, if they fail, that's going to be the end. They're, they're going to be exited. So part of how we do that is establishing a, a team of high psychological safety. Um, also a topic we will spend time on in our open enrollment course next month in October, executive communication and leadership presence, uh, because that's really important. T team members need to feel like failure is okay, that we can learn, that I'm not going to get punished if I deliver bad news or fail. So that's the first step. We need to make sure we're creating an environment where failing fast and learning quickly and agility is really, really central to, to who we are. So if we've created that, as an environment, then you're gonna have very, very few team members that are gonna fall into that trap, but you will have some, and that relates to the slide in front of you. So we want to avoid this final trap, which is the bait and switch trap. So to Nicholas' point, to author is to be vulnerable. To author is to be vulnerable. In other words, what if I author a solution for you? And you look at it and you say, Brandon, I thought you were way smarter than this. Why am I even listening to you? And you fire me, right? I, I, I could have that thought in my mind. And so instead, I might prefer the safety of keeping you in the author's seat. So just asking you what you want me to do. Because in my mind, as long as I'm doing what you asked me to do, even if it fails, it's not my fault. I'm in the editor's seat. So I can say it's not my fault. I'm just doing what Brandon told me to do. Don't look at me. Look at him. You're going to look at anybody. And while that may feel good to those direct reports, um, it doesn't allow for high-performing, world-class, world championship teams. That's what you're looking for. You're not going to get it with a bunch of order takers. And so you, you want to watch out for these bait and switch phrases that are designed to trick you into sitting in the author seat. What do you want me to do? How would you approach this if you were me? I don't want to disappoint you. Can you tell me exactly what you want? Uh, I'm confused, and I don't think I can do this without your help. All phrases that are designed to trick you to get you back in that seat. And because you're a natural author, this is going to feel, you know, oh, oh, so fun and easy to answer. Well, let me let me help you. Let me give you some some ideas, and then we end up telling them what to do. So before, <laughs> excuse me, before you jump in and answer the question, my counsel to everyone listening today would be to pause and say, you know, I have some thoughts around that, and I'm happy to share mine. But before I do, why don't you go back to your desk, back to your office, um, put your best thinking on paper. And let's talk about it tomorrow or later this afternoon. So send them off to author something to you. As long as they're bringing you something to author, then, then you're helping them develop that confidence that it's going to be okay that and helping them get more comfortable with either ownership or initiative or critical thinking. Because that's really what we're trying to elevate. We're trying to elevate that. Now, a couple more final point around that too. Author, editor, you're getting, um, say, an uh, uh, individual contributor to author to us is fantastic. Not necessary. There are some roles more junior in the organization where they can be a little more of an order taker. That, that may happen. Managers, same thing. Really great we get our managers to do this, okay? But not, not critical. Once someone is promoted to director level, if they cannot author up to you, they've been overpromoted. So I'm going to go a little further into the slide. So when I coach my clients on helping to change the dynamic of their team, so there's more author editor, when they share this concept, let's say they have five direct reports, 
two direct reports come right out of the gate and they say, oh my gosh, I love this. And they're authoring ideas for you. It's like the handcuffs have come off. Um, and that doesn't mean their ideas are perfect, but but they're excited. Two more come along a little more slowly. They, they want to see what happens to the first two. They, did they get punished? Did it work out well? And then there's typically one, one that is like this, that really doesn't like the idea of authoring, feels vulnerable, and they're going to push back. So just be aware of that because um, if you've got, if you're senior enough or you've got directors or above on your teams, everyone should be authoring. Everyone should be coming to you with a point of view and everyone should be offering something in those conversations. Uh, Tammy, I saw your hand was up and then it went down for a minute. Anything you'd like to add? No, Brandon, no. Okay, okay, good. Okay, so uh, let, let's go a little further down this path. Few ways to uh, the question, going back to the question that Nicola asked around how do we get folks to get more comfortable with some of this? They're lacking that confidence. Uh, this slide all comes from research done from the American Psychological Association on ways to help people build resilience. Or in other words, get more comfortable taking ownership, initiative, and displaying critical thinking. And so these are some great tips to do that. First, avoid seeing crises as insurmountable problems. So help people, you know, when, if they're taking on a challenge and they're stuck, say, you know, I, I believe in you. This isn't insurmountable. I'm confident that with you and me working together on this, uh, we can figure out a path forward. Look for opportunities for self-discovery. That's the second one. So remind people that the author-editor seats is all about their growth. This is not about you just pushing work onto somebody else. That's not what this is about. This is about you helping them get better and stronger and more confident in the work that they're doing so that when opportunities arise, they're ready. And that opportunity might be your seat when you get promoted or other opportunities. So you're helping them get better, faster, stronger by giving them stretch opportunities. Uh, keep things in perspective. So remind them you're, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna die. You're not gonna get fired. This doesn't go well. We're just gonna have a conversation about it. And then finally, maintain a hopeful outlook. So at Emory's Theology School, some years ago, there was a, a faculty member there named Jim Fowler. Jim has since passed away. Um, but he used to say, as leaders, we want to give people two things, hope and handles. And I think that's a great way, a simple way to think about leadership. Hope, that positive future, that positive energy, this is where I'm trying to take you or take us, and then handles. This is the one thing I need you working on between now and, and next time. So getting them more comfortable authoring and reminding them it's not only going to make the team better, but it's going to help them open up more opportunities and more doors as they're able to accomplish more things and do it in a, a even even better way. So a few more applications on author editor. Author editor is a vertical tool. It works in any vertical relationship. It doesn't work so cleanly in horizontal relationships. So we can talk about that. If that's a question you all might have on how to apply it to a peer. But if we're in a vertical relationship, it works perfectly. So here's our first one. Service provider and a client. Anyone on this call who's ever been in a role that's business development oriented uh, knows this is exactly how you talk to a client. I just spelled out what you already know. You author to a client some options or a menu for them to edit off of or to choose off of. You say, Miss or Mr. Client. You can choose from option A, option B, or option C. What would you like? And it's a reminder to us too that while we say the editor holds a lot of power, the author holds tremendous power. The author sets the menu. So imagine op imagine opening up a restaurant uh, and not putting a menu on the, on the wall. People would walk in, they'd say, well, gosh, I think I'd love some fresh sushi. Uh, Hand-rolled tortilla, uh, I would love that too. Oh, and I would love some pizza. Uh, but, but don't give me that Chicago pizza. I want New York style pizza. Well, we may not have the resources for that. So being able to set the menu really helps to not only uh, allow more focused choice for that client, but also allows us to control our resources better, which is the second point here, presenting to senior leaders. So whether we're presenting up to senior executive team or just to your leader, you always wanna come in with an authored point of view. And the reason why that matters so much is you're actually pre presenting them options that you feel you and your team can execute off of. When we don't go to our senior leaders or our leader that way, and we just say, what do you wanna talk about? That's when you leave 
with all those crazy requests that you don't have resources and time for, which probably happens to most of us on this call, right? They ask for things because they don't know better. Uh, but when we come in with options and make them choose, we at least come away with something we feel like we can we can go do. Um, I, I teach this concept, by the way, to even CEOs on how they present the boards. Because if you go to a board meeting and you don't have a clearly authored point of view for that board, so strong individuals, very strong opinions, and they will take the conversation to the left and to the right real fast. So it uh, makes a big, big difference. So it helps to focus when we have conversations up. And then finally, for those of you on the call who have either embarked on or one day plan on embarking on the journey of parenting, uh, this also applies to that as well. So um, if, if, if the goal for you is to uh, raise fully formed human beings that can take care of themselves, pay their bills, make a positive contribution in society and the world, not living in your basement, if that is the goal, the parents that get there faster, uh, particularly in the, looking at the U.S. culture specifically, but the parents getting there a little faster tend to be the ones that shift from authoring everything in a child's life, moving more into that editor seat sometime in um, tween teen years. So they start to say things like, well, why don't you make your own lunch? Uh, how about you start doing your own laundry? Um, how about you choose what extracurriculars you're no longer going to do versus the ones that you uh, want to start trying? Even though you've been doing this thing since you were four and you were so great at travel baseball and we thought you were going to go to college doing that, letting them choose not to do that and choose something else and even getting a job. So in the mid-1990s in the United States, 30% uh, I mean 70% of all high school students had jobs, 70% mid-1990s. Last time the study was conducted was uh, about 2019, pre-pandemic, and that number had dropped to 30%. Uh, that is a real, real issue. And it, um, part of it is because parents over authoring. So they 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 control and construct everything all the way through the high school years, all the way down to the activities. They do their lunches for their kids, their, their, their clothes for the kids. And so the kids go off to college, uh, all with the design to kind of get them into the very best school. And when they graduate from college, they are not quite ready for prime time. They need a few more years in your basement for extra seasoning. So author editor is all about growing and developing the people around you, whether it's your kiddos at home or your high performing team uh, back in your work world. So I I'm gonna pause there. These are just a few kind of prompt questions for us, uh, for our conversation as we have uh, some time left for any Q and A. Uh, so just generally speaking, any takeaways you have from the author versus editor concept, and then your biggest challenge you've got from going uh, from an author to an editor in your role. Because uh, as I shared with you, while this sounds straightforward, and it is, the complications of doing it are many. Uh, and so those are real, and I would want to help you overcome some of those. So uh, I'm going to pause there. And Nicola, do we see any questions coming in or anything that I might be able to take on for uh, the group here today? We do have some questions. Um... So first of all, sort of an interesting one from, from Connor. Do you identify as a natural author, Brandon? I think you're going to say yes. I do. So obviously I'm biased. I do. I absolutely do. Was, uh, it, was, was that a leading question, Nicola? Was that... It was the first question in the Q&A. So um, I thought I would, would ask that. Um, Barry asks assuming less than 10% of your team can effectively operate in this model, what's your recommended approach for staff who might be more, shall we say, printers on the team, um, but good at it? So I think that means that they're, they're, they're good at just churning out the work. Yes. So if we, if we, um, if I borrow from my colleague, Peter Topping, uh, who still does a lot of work in the business school, uh, he talks about um, two different kinds of folks in our workplace. We have our high potentials, which obviously we're talking about here today, but we also have our solid citizens. Now, solid citizens are really important. They're folks that maybe do the same job, do it do it well, have been doing it for 10 years or 15 years. They maybe are, are, are printers. Um, also really, really strong. The, 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 the key to the printers is I think in a small way, we can still expect them to take ownership, initiative, and display critical thinking. There's probably some routine tasks that they need to be doing. So they mm -hmm. still need to be coming to the meetings with a, um, a status update. So I, whether we've got our, our solid citizens or our high potentials, 
I I treat everybody the same. Everyone should be coming to these one on ones with something in hand, whether that goes whether it's just a stats update or something a little more more thoughtful. Go stats stats update to a to an analysis or point of view to even recommendations, which of course is what we teach all of our students at the business school is how to come in with formulated recommendations. So uh, so that would be my my kind of answer there. You could still have those folks but still require that they bring you something to react to every meeting, because the more questions you have to ask and probe, it's more of your time. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to preserve your time so you have more of it to work on the business. So Carolyn just asked for prioritization. While people managers should set priorities, I'm finding it necessary for my folks to prioritize for their own work too. How do we balance them prioritizing their own work versus what we help them with. I think it's okay to give them some flexibility on how they need to prioritize their time given their life, but still be really, really firm on your commander's intent. And if you remember commander's intent, um, borrowing from our, our, our wonderful friend, Ken Keen, um, it is why, what, and when. So you can still say to your team, hey, team, this is what needs to get done this week. And this needs to be done by Friday at five o'clock. And this is why it's so critical. How mm -hmm. you work that into your flow this week and how where you want to start is up to you. But by Friday at five o'clock, we need to have this deliverable done because this is why it's so critical. So mm -hmm. I think it's okay to still establish, you still need to establish the high level expectation, but give them some flexibility on how they use their time on a day-to-day -day basis. So Andy asks, um, he says, I, I, I love and believe in this approach a lot. Uh, I work with managers all the time that are having to learn to be comfortable with more editing and less authoring. I think the 80% is a good goal. However, isn't it more of a continuum based on the competence and confidence level of the team member? Yes. So I, I came right out of the gate and said, here's your goal, 80%. You got to work there, everybody. Like, it, don't be okay with yourself and give yourself grace. If it's flipped right now and you're authoring 80% of the time and only editing 20%, let's mm -hmm. see if we can gradually, one team member at a time, let's see if we can move that percentage up. The, the main point is I want you, the more you're in that editor seat, the more high performing your team's going to be and the, the shorter those conversations are going to be. So you have more time to be on the business. Mm -hmm. So to, to Andy's point, it's absolutely a continuum, 100%. And based on what you heard me say today, Try and identify where you are in that continuum and what you can start doing to to move further along. Mm -hmm. And and this uh, Cheryl asked the question, and I think this means that she's asking you to sort of repeat some of what you said here. How do you motivate a team to be authors? She said, "My team feels weak in this area." Yeah, I think so that's I think jump in advice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a couple of things. I think first, remember, we're, we're setting the, just set the expectation. See, this is, we're going to do this and this is why. It's going to help all of you get better. And then one-on-one, -on -one, you know, we need to identify how we can motivate that person. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're motivating them by saying to them, uh, this is going to open up more opportunities for you because it will. You're, you're developing more competencies in your team, which then if you get promoted or an opportunity comes along their way, they're, they're ready for it. So you could even anchor it in those conversations to where, where do you want to go in your career? Well, let's talk about how we can use this approach to help develop you there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you know, anchoring it to that can also be really helpful. Um, the, the other way to approach it too is to just help them see that this is going to help them actually gain more time back because it's going to help them feel a little more sense of uh, control too. Also should reduce anxiety, frankly because you've got people taking more than an ownership of an initiative. They're not just waiting for you. So you may need to customize that particular motivator to each person. But the general theme is it's all about opening opportunities and elevating your performance. And, and who, who doesn't want that? Right. We have got a sort of a, a rush of questions that just came in, that just came in and, and we've probably got one time for one last quick question which is, a, I think, a really interesting one. How can you apply the author-editor concept horizontally to get peers to contribute to authoring when you're on committees or on projects yeah. on a senior leadership team? Is, is that possible? Absolutely, it is. So you have, to, you have to modify it a little bit. You can't use it in its purest form. 
So say, let's say Nicola and I were peers and I went over to Nicola and said, Nicola, why don't you author this thing for me to edit? She's going to say, Brandon, who, who do you think you are? You know, uh, that's not going to work very well. Um, it's because it has a power dynamic based on the seats. So the way you have to approach it with peers is very simple. You have to both sit in the same seats at the same time. So then instead I might say, Nicola, we've got this thing I can really use your, use your help on. How about we get carbon hour out together? Let's see what ideas we can author together. Let's brainstorm together. Let's think about it, reflect, we'll come back and then we'll edit together and decide what we want to do. So you, you've got to kind of sit in the same seats at the same time. So there isn't the, the awkwardness of the power dynamic, um, but it can be very effective that way. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, look, thank you so much, um, Brandon, for, for the session this morning. The, the chat's going crazy. The, the q and is going crazy. Um, I really appreciate uh, the, your words and, and, and your thoughts. Um, always very helpful. Um, I've heard this, you know, I've heard you say some of this before, and I, I keep scribbling down things to remind myself. So thank you. Tammy, over to you. Great, thank you, Nicola. Uh, awesome presentation, Brandon, and a lot of great tips. Um, as always, um, I, I was thinking of a show that I watched last night with Gordon Ramsay, his master chef, and he brings on home cooks, and at the end, they become chefs. And that was one of the things that the cook said last night is like, I'm, I'm a chef now. I create, I initiate, I think. Cooks follow what I um, what I advise them to do. So um, great idea on helping more chefs, uh, people become more chefs and less cooks uh, in our workplace. Uh, Brenda, if you could stop sharing really quickly. Thank you. Um, I just have a few slides that I want to um, share with everybody regarding um, upcoming um, business of our breakfast. Um, so on October the 5th, we have Humans Use AI Assistance, the role of loss aversion uh, with Jesse Boxstedt. October the 19th, uh, Jamie Turner is going to join us and talk about leader development as a lever to increase productivity and decrease attrition. And then on November the 2nd, uh, we're going to um, talk about leveraging chat GPT. So it's going to build on the information that Jesse's going to provide us on AI. Um, so leveraging chat GTP to derive value for your business. Um, so we hope to see you on one of these uh, upcoming business over breakfast. And we also would like to make you aware of some short courses that we have coming up. Um, our negotiations and influence course takes place on October the 2nd and 4th. But if you'd like to hear more from Brandon and other faculty members on communication and leadership presence, uh, Brandon will be sharing more on author versus editor during our executive communication and leadership presence course on October 10th and 11th. Um, and we would love for you to join us for our AI machine learning for business program that's taking place on October the 23rd and 24th. It will give you a foundational understanding in AI and machine learning that you can help um, speak with uh, those technical uh, people within your business and help to develop the thinking and the leadership and the strategy behind AI and how you can incorporate it within your organization. Uh, disrupting your business strategy uh, will take place on November the 8th and 9th, as well as our finance and accounting for non-financial managers. And one thing I'd like to add before I leave this slide, we do have MBA level courses. These are courses that are through uh, Gozora's business the school that you can uh, take. These are going to be starting in the spring and we'll have more information on that coming soon. So again, I want to thank you for joining us today. You're all a big piece of the puzzle. Make those cooks into chefs um, and spend time appropriately authoring versus editing. Thank you again, Brandon, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in a future Business Over Breakfast. Take care. Bye, everyone. Have a great rest of your week.